understand, and we also describe how this is operating. But the why behind it is kind of banal, you know, in the sense of uh, it's money and power. So let's say you have something that would fit on a little table this big, and it's a uh, generator, and it's pulling energy out of what's called the quantum vacuum, or zero-point energy field, which was proven to exist back in the 50s. Now, physicists have described this energy field, if you had a coffee mug, the amount of space in that coffee mug has enough potential power to boil off all the oceans of the world quote, unquote. It's what Tesla called, uh, not the fake car company, actually Nikola Tesla. Um, I call it fake Tesla cars because if they're plugged into the grid, they're they're not real Teslas. We'll get into this. Um, but those that energy field is uh, everywhere, and you can tap into it. And when you tap into it, you're tapping into this energy field that can be converted to electricity or thrust. So is the energy field, is it everything in between objects? Is that? It's not just between, it's within. So if you take, let's take the chair you're sitting in or I'm in. It's occupying a volume of space. Mm -hmm. When you get past the molecular to the atomic level of this, and then subatomic, the quarks, you get this into this pluripotent, it's like the, the foam at the surface of the deep ocean. Okay. That all of matter is fluxing in and out of. The early Lockheed Skunk Works man-made UFOs were called flux liners. Flux liners. Yep. Where they were pulling energy from this quantum vacuum flux field. Very advanced physics. I mean, we understand it very well. I want to put your audience to sleep going into the arcana of the physics of it. But the point I'm making is... That was mastered decades ago. This, this technology has been around for, for decades. Uh, well, about 100 years that there has been empirical evidence of this energy field. Nikola Tesla called it the infinite energy field. Um, there were others who discovered it all the way back to the late 1800s. Now, they didn't, they didn't have the physics down of what was happening. But in terms of just observing the phenomenon empirically, you know, here you, you set up a high voltage system, suddenly more energy is coming out than you're putting in. Those okay. are called over unity systems or free energy because once you get it tapped, it's just flowing, right? And so that means that every home, business, car, manufacturing, village in Africa would ha be able to have a, a device that would not be very expensive, frankly, to mass manufacture that would generate all the energy they need for all the needs that we have for a modern civilization. And this would be wonderful. There's no pollution, there's no radiation. And once you have the system, there is no cost. There's no refueling. The bad news is that if you're an oligarch, a global oligarch, controlling the macroeconomic system, big oil, big global systems, uh, and let me translate for those of you who've been in the Middle East, our vital national security interests translates to one word, O-I-L, oil, energy. <clears throat> so the problem is, you know, if that technology were to be disclosed, it's, a, you know, it's a quadrillion dollars. It's a thousand trillion dollars or more in proven assets, oil, gas, coal, public utilities that are obsolete. It's like, you know, obsolete. It's like a, a royal typewriter, a horse and buggy. That's what they're protecting. So the entire energy field, everything that has anything to do with energy becomes completely obsolete at this point. Yeah, and all, Which, tran and, and all transportation systems, internal combustion engines, jet engines, rockets, surface roads. So now surface roads, I say that only because when you take that same physics and do a torsion a counter-rotating field, you can get what's called an, an electrogravitic effect, where, or anti-gravity, pop culture term, it's a terrible term, it's not anti-gravity, but you can collect, cr cr create this electromagnetic field where an object becomes essentially weightless. 
and can move. This is why you, if you look at the radar tracings of these things, these objects can be moving at 200,000 miles an hour, make a right-hand turn. And there are occupants on these. Now, you know, I mean, any pilot knows if you had the G-forces of that, your brains would come out of your nose. Mm -hmm. There's no way it'd be fatal. But because it's calling, for, correcting for 1G, and there's a sort of a bubble, an envelope in space-time that this object is moving in, there's no limit to what it can do. So They it don't go, feel the G. They don't feel it and go straight up, you know, at, like one of the radar things we have uh, from Belgium, <clears throat> from I got from the Belgian Air Force, was an object that was at, you know, slightly above AGL, a few feet of AG, above ground level. And it went from there to boom, like 100,000 feet in, in one radar swoop, you know, boom. And we have a lot of cases like that that we've collected. And, you know, the question at this point is, how is that happening? Well, we know how that's happening. And so I, here's the issue with disclosing all this. When you get past the superficial level, here's a machine, here's a device, here's this— the scientists, like myself, are going to say, well, how is it doing that? And if they have a thinking brain, mm -hmm. which, of course, this is a big assumption now with our educational system <laughs> collapsing, <laughs> it's like, sorry to say, but, <laughs> my God, I mean, the kids that are now trying to get educated in the system now, God help us all. So, but the, the, the fact is that's going to be asked. Now, what's interesting is that the Pentagon has officially said those objects that are that were have been released of the Tic Tac and other uh, UFOs that have been documented with sensors on ships, on board aircraft, and in space. Well, they're not disclosing those sensors, but I know what they are. Those <clears throat> are are physical objects moving without any known means of propulsion. Go look at what's been said by the Pentagon. Now. What the, uh, the person who said that at the Pentagon says, we don't know how they're moving because that spokesman hasn't been read in to these deep black projects that are in this parallel universe of this secret government. It's been my job to collect the actionable intelligence, the documents, and the people who know this and put it together and put it in the briefings for people. So I've provided this to every minister of defense and secretary of defense for the four of the five eyes, which are, of course, you know, U.S., Canada, Australia, U.K. I have not done it for New Zealand. But and what I've, in every single case, when I've met with these guys, either they're former or current MOD heads or what have you, they've said, we were never read into this. So I, this data point, let me extend the data point globally. So some years ago, there was this, this really amazing guy named uh, Lord Hill Norton. He was a five-star admiral. They used to call him a sea lord. Don't you love, I mean, I love the British. They're fantastic. A sea lord. And <clears throat> he had been head of the MOD, which means in the UK, you're head of MI5, MI6, like our CIA and stuff. But he was also head of the military committee for NATO. And I met with him at his house in Wiltshire, um, no, in Hampshire, in England, some years ago. And he asked me to come because he wanted me to bring the briefing document that I had put together for the president. I think at that time it was, it was the late Clinton years. And I said, all right, I'll come over. And I went over with my four daughters and wife, and they went off to see the Salisbury Cathedral. And I went and met with this former MOD head. And he was livid. He says, this never came across my desk. I was never read into this. And I said, and yet I have files from your own MOD about the landing of one of these objects at the Bentwaters, uh, Rendlesham Forest Bentwaters Air Force Base. No kidding. Yep. I have, the, I have the documents. I have the trace landing. I have the U.S. military Air Force people's testimony that were there. So at this point, I have about 1,100 of these folks. What's a trace landing? When, a, when one of these, uh, in this case, it was an extraterrestrial vehicle, not one of the man-made ones. So we call them ETVs for the ones that are of extraterrestrial origin. The ones that are man-made are often called ARVs, alien reproduction vehicles, meaning that they're simulating, not totally, but simulating the um, energy propulsion capabilities of what we've reverse engineered and studied since the 40s. Okay. So we'll get into this in a moment. How, what's the technology transfer arc 
from the 40s to now. And that's very interesting. It's going to be in our new film called The Lost Century and How to Reclaim It is the subcaption um, title. But um, the Minister of Defense was furious. And, and, you know, he was a bit bombastic and kind of, you know, his, his piercing blue eyes, a real character. And, um, and, and but he was, I think he was hurt. I mean, if you have that level of responsibility and you find out you were Zoomed, I'm probably the most important military and intelligence issue in the 20th century, in 21st century. He, he, and he said, well, why wouldn't they have told me? He said, it, it becomes personal for mm-hmm. these men. Uh, and I said, well, let me ask your qu- question with a question. And he said, oh, what do you mean? He thought I was being an impertinent yank, w- which I can be. But... <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, no, I, I was doing it as sort of a, a way of sort of uh, illustrating this point. And I said, well, what would you have done if you had found out that there was an organization and a project, global, global, that had engaged in assassinations, wet works of innocent people, uh, killings, uh, it's a CIA term, wet works, for, you know, if you're on the watch group list, which I have been on, um, and that is engaging in all manner of criminal activities, up to including drug running, it has embezzled trillions of dollars from Western economies. And they have the technologies that would save the Earth's biosphere in a generation in poverty. But they are now an existential threat to the world and to the United States and your country, the United Kingdom. And he almost jumped out of his chair and says, I wouldn't have stood for it for a bloody minute. Like that, just in a rage. And I went, well, that's why they didn't tell you. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.